Micro folks, this is spring 2020. It's March 15th, 2020, and we're starting week nine of our course. Um, we were just told last week that because of the coronavirus epidemic pandemic, that campus will be closed and we have to present all of our lab and lecture information online. So for lecture folks, I'll, I'll do what I've tried to do in the past, and that is I'll do a, an, um, a voiceover of the PowerPoints, um, and then depending on how much time I have, um, I could maybe try to go over some of the study guide questions, but I'm not guaranteed I'll have that time. I'm scrambling here to try to get lab and lecture um, videos made, so, but at least we'll try to have the, um, for lecture, the voiceovers on the lecture PowerPoints. Um, oh, in addition, last semester, fall 2019, I tried to record some of the lecture and labs uh, just using my MacBook, the little camera. Um, so I'll try to find those links and post them as well in case those might be of some help. Okay, you guys, so um, we were working on um, Unit 6, Microbial Genetics, and we'd started the second part, the second PowerPoint. Um, and I think in both the Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday lecture section, we had gotten through the lac operon of E. coli, and we had mentioned that in addition to the lac operon, which um, E. coli uses to control the expression of the structural genes for beta-galactosidase, lactose transport protein, and the transacetylase, we also used examples of how some bacteria have inducible antibiotic resistance operons and that some bacterial pathogens have inducible virulence factor operons, such as Carinobacteria diphtheria and um, its inducible diphtheria toxin gene. So um, I'll just go ahead and do an audio on the operons, um, and then I'll, I'll cut it short. And folks, we'll switch this up um, for lecture exam two, which will be in a week, and it's, it's going to be an online exam, and I hope to have some practice quizzes for you online so you can practice taking these online exams. Um, we won't have mutations on it. We'll, for lecture exam two, it'll be um, metabolism, microbial growth, and microbial genetics through the operon. So we had covered all these topics face to face. So the mutations and everything past mutations on this second microbial genetics PowerPoint would go on lecture exam three. And I'm going to hope that we'll actually have campus reopen and we can be face-to-face -face for the last part of the semester. That would sure make our lives easier. Okay, you guys, so this will be a lot of repetition on the operons, but repetition is okay. <clears throat> All right, folks, so um, always, always we're remember remembering the central dogma of information flow in cells as described by Francis Crick. And remember, you guys, we talked about DNA replication where DNA acts as a template to make a DNA copy. That's required to copy the chromosome before the cell divides in two. And we're using bacteria as our model organisms. And then we talked about gene expression and we're stop talking about structural genes, genes that encode information for proteins. <clears throat> and so we said in gene expression there's two steps. The first step transcription is when DNA acts as a template to make RNA. And then in the second step called translation, RNA, specifically messenger RNAs, uses a template to make a protein. So now in cells, this is our accepted flow of information. We said, however, some viruses like to violate these rules. For example, the retroviruses such as HIV. Um, HIV has an RNA genome. When HIV gets into our cells, they'll use their RNA genome as a template <clears throat> to make a DNA copy. So this process is called reverse transcription and the enzyme that carries out reverse transcription is called HIV reverse transcriptase. So when we get to the next unit on viruses, we'll come back and talk a little bit about this reverse transcription. So this is just a cartoon, folks. I'm showing the two steps in gene expression. DNA is a template to make mRNA in the process of transcription, and then mRNA is a template to make our protein in the process called translation. And those topics were covered in the, the first um, microbial genetics PowerPoint, and we had audios for those. So folks, now we are going to describe how some bacteria can turn on and turn off gene expression, and specifically we're going to look at how some bacteria can turn on and turn off transcription. It turns out there are three types of genes in the bacterial chromosome. Constitu 
constitutive genes are um, structural genes um, that encode information for proteins that are constantly needed by the cell. So constitutive genes are constantly being expressed. That is, they're constantly being transcribed and translated. And a perfect example would be the genes that encode information for the enzymes used in glycolysis. The cell always has to have um, enzymes for glycolysis. So those genes for the glycolytic enzymes are constantly transcribed and translated constantly express, and thus they're called constitutive genes. However, there's other genes that encode proteins um, that um, these other genes encoding proteins that will only be needed under special circumstances. So some genes will be expressed, meaning transcribed and translated, only when the protein product is needed. Such genes are called inducible genes, um, and these genes will be transcribed only when a signal molecule is present, and our model of an inducible gene is going to be the lac operon of E. coli. Now, um, note that there's a third group of genes called repressible genes, and these are genes that will be transcribed only if a signal molecule is absent. And classically, um, we use the tryptophan operon of E. coli. We're not going to do repressible genes, you guys. We're only going to do inducible genes. Um, in comparing inducible to repressible genes, inducible genes are usually genes for proteins that are going to be involved in catabolism, breaking something down, or in transporting a substance into the cell. Repressible genes are often um, structural genes that encode anabolic enzymes, enzymes that are going to be involved in biosynthesis. But again, you guys, we're going to focus on the inducible genes. We're going to use the lac operon of E. coli. This was this was um, the first um, example of how bacteria can turn on and turn off transcription that was um, described. It was the first model of how cells can control gene um, expression. And this model was worked upon um, in the 40s by two French microbiologists, Jacob and Minode, and there's some powerful history that goes along with it that they were working in Paris when Paris was invaded by the Nazis and what they had to do to protect their work. So there's some, a lot of human drama there. But we'll just focus you guys on understanding what we mean by an operon and exploring how E. coli can uh, control gene expression in the lac operon. So first of all, an operon, this is a new term, so let's just take it slowly. So you guys, in the lac operon of E. coli, there are three structural genes. Remember, structural genes include, encode information for proteins. So the LAC-Z gene, the LAC-Z gene encodes the bacterial enzyme beta-galactosidase, which hydrolyzes lactose. It breaks the glycosidic bond in lactose between glucose and galactose, and that's required before the, the monosaccharides, the two sugars, can enter glycolysis. In humans, we would call the equivalent enzyme um, lactase. The LAC-Y gene encodes the information for the lactose transport protein, some, sometimes called the lactose permease protein. And the, the um, LAC-A gene um, encodes information for an enzyme called a transacetylase, and we're just going to ignore this little guy. So we're just going to be focused on LAC-Z and LAC-Y. So we're used to that, these structural genes encoding information for proteins. Um, let's look further here. Okay, so this P stands for the promoter. So this is the DNA sequence to which RNA polymerase would bind and then would then start transcribing the lac ZY and A gene into polycystronic messenger RNA. But what's new here, see there's a new DNA sequence called the operator. And the operator is a DNA sequence between the promoter and the structural genes. So we could say this is the on-off switch for the lac operon. If we could put a protein, if we could bind a protein right here on the operator, that would physically block RNA polymerase from transcribing these genes down here. So the name of the um, protein that can bind to the operator, it's called the repressor protein. And they don't, they just, here folks, it's the LAC I gene. So the LAC I gene is not part of the, of the LAC operon. It's a constitutive gene. It's constantly transcribed and translated. And the LAC I gene encodes a repressor protein which can bind to the operator. So think of repressor, R, repressor equals roadblock. So when the repressor binds the operator, it creates a roadblock. And then RNA polymerase can't transcribe these genes, so we turn off transcription. <clears throat> now, when would we want this to happen? When would we want to shut down transcription 
of the lac operon genes. Well, <clears throat> as biologists, we believe that most organisms are living in environments where nutrients are limiting. And therefore, it's a survival advantage if cells, organisms, aren't wasteful. They're not going to use up nutrients um, when they aren't required. So, folks, if we think of an E. coli, and let's say the E. coli is living in an environment where there's no lactose, no milk present, it would not make survival sense for E. coli to spend energy and building blocks transcribing and translating the um, beta-galactosidase, the lactose transport protein, when there's no lactose around. So in the circumstances in which there's no lactose present, the repressor protein, and here we see it being transcribed, and here it's translated, so this is the um, illustrator's cartoon of the repressor protein. The repressor protein will bind to the operator, and that's going to be our roadblock. Remember, our repressor is for roadblock. So in the absence of lactose, the repressor binds the operator, and RNA polymerase cannot transcribe these genes. And that's good. The, the E. coli isn't going to waste resources when there's no lactose present. But what happens if the environment changes and now suddenly lactose is present? So this is really cool. So here's our repressor protein. Um, if lactose is present, a tiny, tiny amount is going to be transported into the cell and it will be chemically modified into um, um, allolactose. And on a short answer um, type question, folks, if I ask you what is the inducer of the lac operon, that is what turns on transcription, you could tell me either allolactose or lactose, either one I would accept. So <clears throat> the allolactose lactose is going to bind to the repressor protein and notice how when lactose, allolactose binds, the repressor protein changes shape. And in this, this new shape, the repressor protein can't bind to the operator anymore. So our roadblock falls off, RNA polymerase can bind, and now it's going to transcribe the structural genes into um, polycystronic messenger RNA carrying information for two or more proteins. And then the mRNA is going to be translated by the ribosomes and we'll get beta-galactosidase, lactose permease, and transacetylase, transacetylase um, enzyme. So the, um, the signal molecule which will turn on transcription, which will induce the lac operon, is going to be lactose. And it makes sense because um, the genes associated with the lac operon are genes associated with hydrolyzing lactose or transporting it into the cell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, um, I totally understand how lactose transport and metabolism might not be that exciting, right? But what's so cool with these basic um, discoveries, then we see how bacteria can use, for example, inducible operons in situations we humans maybe are more concerned with. So, for example, folks, they've discovered that um, bacteria can have inducible antibiotic resistance genes. Um, and there might be, um, in these inducible antibiotic resistance operons, there might be genes for um, one or more antibiotic uh, resistance uh, proteins. And so if we use a LAC operon as our, as our model, can you tell me what you think the inducer would be for these um, antibiotic resistant operons? So the inducer would be one of the antibiotics, right? It would bind to the repressor. The repressor can't bind to the operator. And then RNA polymerase can transcribe the antibiotic resistance genes. Another, this is, this is kind of complicated, folks, but it's also fascinating. Um, so there is an in inducible diphtheria toxin, operon. So just some background, you guys. Um, Crinibacterium diphtheria is a, a gram-positive bacterium. It causes the disease we know as diphtheria. It's kind of fascinating. We'll get into this more in the next unit on viruses. But the toxin gene was, was actually carried to crinibacteria diphtheria by a bacterial virus, a bacteriophage. Um, and the phage DNA carrying the toxin gene inserted itself into the chromosome of the crinibacterium diphtheria. And we'll see later we, we call this state lysogeny. So not to worry about that for lecture exam two. <clears throat> but what's so very interesting about the diphtheria toxin gene 
is if the Carinibacterium diphtheria is living in, in an environment where there's lots of iron available, and iron is required, for example, folks, for cytochromes, right? If you're going to carry out aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, you need cytochromes, and a cytochrome has to have iron, right? So if the Carinibacterium diphtheria is living in an environment where there's lots of iron available, it doesn't need to make the diphtheria toxin, and therefore a repressor protein, um, a repressor protein bound to iron, um, then is active. So the repressor protein has to bind iron before it's active, and by active, I mean that it's going to bind to the operator and block transcription of the diphtheria toxin. However, when Carinibacterium diphtheria moves into humans, humans have evolved iron binding proteins so that bacteria can't access our iron. So in a human, there's going to be low free available iron. And because of that, um, the repressor protein um, will no longer have iron bound to it. It changes shape so it's no longer active. It falls off the operator. And then that will permit RNA polymerase to transcribe um, the diphtheria toxin gene. And then the mRNA will be uh, translated into diphtheria toxin. So diphtheria toxin, you guys, protein toxin, it inhibits ADS ribosomes, which we humans have in our cytoplasm. It kills our cells. And, and the reason for this is then when our cells die, our cells release iron. And then the iron can be used by the Carinibacterium um, diphtheria. And um, it often colonizes the throat, can cause a sore throat and a fever. And we'll see that it um, causes this horrible pseudomembrane, false membrane um, to form. So it damages epithelium. The toxin can be absorbed and damage the heart, the, kid, the kidney, and um, uh, cells of the, of the nervous system. And again, this so-called false membrane, pseudomembrane, can form in the back of the throat, can block airflow. The good thing is, you guys, we have a vaccine, um, the diphtheria vaccine, which you usually um, give to our children when they're they're. Um, young, but we also might want to consider that maybe we need it as we get older. Okay, and if if a child or a human develops um, diphtheria, we can give antibodies against the diphtheria toxin, and those antibodies against the toxin are called antitoxin, and they can be life saving. This next slide I pirated from a another PowerPoint online, and it just gives you some idea, folks. This is the infectious disease diphtheria caused by the gram positive bacterium Carinibacteria diphtheria. The damage is caused by that inducible diphtheria toxin. Here's that pseudomembrane, you guys, that we were talking about. So with the um, host cell damage and inflammation, fibrin and white blood cells make this um, false membrane. And it can actually occlude airflow. I mean, if it covers the, um, the entire airway. And you might say, well, just rip it off. Well, if you rip it off, you have hemorrhage, bleeding, and you haven't gotten rid of the bacteria, so the pseudomembrane is just going to um, form again. So here's another example of the pseudomembrane. And then in addition, folks, um, um, as we said, the toxin can be absorbed, cause heart damage, um, peripheral nerve damage, kidney damage. And here, folks, and, and I'm be I believe this would be from colonization of a wound, you can also get these horrible skin lesions form with diphtheria. Okay, so folks, that will be the end of the information for lecture exam two for spring 2020. If this video gets used in future um, um, semesters of Bio 440, um, we might include the next section on mutations for our lecture exam two. But again, you guys, for spring 2020, this is the end of the information for our lecture exam two. And then, folks, um, I will go ahead and do a video on a little short little section on mutations. So for spring 2020, mutations would be the beginning of information on lecture exam three. So I'll stop here, you guys, and then in a day or two, I'll continue doing the videos for mutations, horizontal gene transfer, plasmids, transposons, and antibiotic resistant. And that will be the end of our genetics, microbial genetics section part two.